Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. This is going to be a brief talk on an important topic, and a topic where I've seen a number of cases recently, somewhat unusual, and it's desmoid tumors of the mesentery, which is a great mimicker of other GI pathology. So let's just take a step back. Primary tumors arising in the mesentery are relatively rare. On the other hand, the mesentery is a frequent avenue of spread from malignant neoplasms through the peritoneal cavity and between the peritoneal spaces and the retroperitoneum. And we said this literally 20 years ago. That was Sheila Sheth. Now, one of the things we spoke about is that you can have mesenteric masses and they present in unusual ways from nonspecific symptoms of abdominal pain to weight loss to a palpable mass to symptoms like diarrhea. But in many cases, it's an incidental finding. CT may be the first study to detect these findings, and so it's very important for us to get a good differential diagnosis and figure out how best to manage the patient. Now, one of the tumors we spoke about were desmoid tumors. They're rare, locally aggressive, non-encapsulated masses resulting from a benign proliferation of fibrous tumors and fibrous tissue. Now, the thing about desmoid tumors, when we mention the desmoid tumor, we typically think about a mass in the abdominal wall, say the rectus muscle that's slightly enhancing. We talk about a differential diagnosis like endometriosis. But abdominal desmoids can occur sporadically and develop anywhere in the abdomen beyond the musculature and be seen in the retroperitoneum, be seen in the pelvis, and really simulate a range of processes in the patient's mesentery. Now, we do see them more commonly in certain select instances, patients with familiar adenomas polyposis, Gardner syndrome. You can see desmoid tumors up to about 18% of the cases. Remember that familiar adenomas polyposis, you'll see polyps in the stomach, you'll see polyps in the small bowel, and often the colon. Now, in this article by Calvert, going a little bit further, desmoid tumors are known as aggressive fibromatosis, so those terms are interchangeable. Most of the time, the tumors are aggressive, but not malignant. Only a small percent will be malignant. As we mentioned, desmoid tumors can occur sporadically or associated with familial adenomatous polyposis. And among the individuals with FAP, desmoids more frequently occur in the intra-abdominal and abdominal wall locations, with most arising from the peritoneum. But in saying that, you still can see these desmoid tumors in the mesentery, even with patients without polyposis. What's challenging about these tumors is, again, when you don't have a history of polyposis, is being able to distinguish them from other tumors. So let's look at a nice example. Here's a patient with a mass in the right lower quadrant on the axial and on the coronal views. And if I go back to the axial, there's the mass. And what could you think about? Well, I could think about lymphoma. I could think about a carcinoid tumor. This is kind of late phase imaging. It's not very bright. I could think of adenopathy for a number of causes, small bowel tumor, maybe a meckle, something like that. You can see it nicely again on the coronal view. And again, it's a solid mass, right? Nothing very tricky, it's solid. It's in the mesentery pushing on the bowel. It'd be hard to say it wasn't involving the bowel here. The vessels look okay. Here it is again with a little more contrast. It has minimal enhancement. It's not very vascular. It is fairly well defined against the small bowel, so it's really more in the mesentery. If you couldn't separate it from small bowel, you could even think about an implant, carcinomatosis, or an implant from, say, melanoma might be a consideration. Interestingly, you can see the mass on the PET scan right there, but there's no increased avidity, which would be unlikely for lymphoma or adenocarcinoma or any aggressive malignancy. Same thing on the axial and coronal, where you look at the MIP, uh, you look at the axials, plus the PET superimposed. So what is giving me a mass 
right lower quadrant, about four centimeters, but not pet avid. It's really interesting, right? Again, you go through the possibilities. Adenopathy, malignant or benign, should be positive on pet lymphoma. Almost always, carcinoid should be showing something. Well, this was desmoid fibromatosis. This patient did not have familiar polyposis, but desmoid fibromatosis, or desmoid tumors for short, can occur, simulate a mass, and can grow. When they grow, they can eventually obstruct bowel because they can cause a desmoplastic reaction. Now, in this article by Rosa, a recent article looking at a head-to-toe approach for desmoid tumors, the most common desmoid tumors are sporadic and extra-abdominal ones. The typical clinical presentation is a slow-growing, painless, or minimally symptomatic soft tissue mass. Approximately 30% are related to FAP. So again, you could see that we can talk about an incidental finding, a slow-growing mass simulating other processes. So again, it's a challenging diagnosis. Some facts with desmoids, let me go through them again. 30% of familial adenomas polyposis have desmoid type fibromatosis. 16% of patients with fibromatosis have FAP, another way to look at it. The mean age is around 40 years. There's female predominance from puberty to age 40. In older patients, the male to female ratio is basically one to one. And in patients with FAP, there's a male predominance. Again, in the article by Rosa, intra-abdominal desmoid tumors uh, significantly differ between sporadic and familial adenomatous polyposis-related cases. Only 5% of sporadic tumors are intra-abdominal, where 80% of the FAP-related are intra-abdominal, especially mesenteric ones. It does make the point that if you see a mass and you're thinking a desmoid tumor, ask the question, does this patient have polyposis? Now, it's possible they don't, or maybe it's not been diagnosed to this point. Mesenteric desmoid tumors are the most common primary tumor of the mesentery. That's kind of interesting. And again, the association with Gardner syndrome. And the description by Rosa, they're usually visualized as large masses, even over 15 centimeters, isodense to muscle. Uncommonly, it can entrap the ureters or encase small bowel loops, leading to intestinal obstruction or perforation. Otherwise, in patients with FAP, the lesions are smaller and multiple. So another thing, if you see multiple lesions, you got to be thinking about a polyposis syndrome. Single lesion, it could just be a sporadic type of case. Again, how you manage these patients is somewhat difficult. The article does make the point. There's a wait and see attitude at times. Surgery, radiation therapy, chemo, and hormonal and molecular targeted drugs are all possible. I think very much it depends on location. It depends on is the tumor resectable and is the tumor going to cause problems as we go forward. So let's look at some examples. Here's a patient with abdominal pain. Look at that mass in the right lower quadrant. Large, solid mass with cystic component. Interestingly, I thought maybe it encased the bowel, but it's really pushing on the bowel rather than encasing. I mean, I would think about lymphoma here. I would think about a sarcoma. I would think about a big gist tumor. Those are all good possibilities. There's some vascularity, but it's solid, not really neovascularity. Look how large it is, and look at the blush you can see within the tumor. Again, displacing and not obstructing. Here it is with the volume rendered images, and here it is with volume rendering and MIP. Look at some of the prominent vascularity, the splaying of the SMA, the stretching of multiple mesenteric vessels. It's kind of an interesting mass. Again, there aren't that many possibilities. Metastasis to the mesentery, a, a big, you know, gist tumor is a good thought. Lymphoma is a great thought. Adenocarcinoma, probably this was an adeno. Usually they don't present at this size. And when they do present, there's bowel obstruction. Interestingly, despite the size of this mass, 
Here it is more in venous phase imaging. It's not really obstructing the bowel. It's displacing structures. It's solid and cystic. This is really a great case. You go through a differential diagnosis, mesenteric mass. Again, it's hard to get around things like lymphoma, maybe a liposarcoma or other sarcoma. I'm thinking malignancy. I'm not thinking anything benign. I'm not thinking about sclerosing mesenteritis, which typically is calcified and not this large. I'm not thinking about metastasis, though occasionally something like melanoma can give you really large masses. Here it is from the sagittal perspective, and that was a mesenteric desmoid tumor. Now it's interesting, as I mentioned some of these, the differential lymphoma, gist tumor arising from small bowel, typically exophytic, carcinoid, usually has a desmoplastic reaction, so we can separate it. Sclerosing mesenteritis, usually it's not that bulky, and calcification is common in about 70% of cases. And occasionally adenocarcinoma, be it from the small bowel or appendix or even the colon, can simulate these processes. So let's look at some more examples. Large right lower quadrant mass, solid, similar to the last case, coronal, very smooth margins, and displacement. This was desmoid fibromatosis as well. Just a really nice example. Solid, some vascularity, displacement, but no obstruction. Look how it's stretching the vessels, but it's not obstructing. Really nicely shown in the volume rendering. It almost looks like you can draw a line around it. So again, what things you're going to think about? Desmoid tumor is a good one, but again, lymphoma, though a solid mass homogeneous for lymphoma, not that great. Just as a great thought as we suggested. There aren't that many a duplication type mass, but those are cystic, not so solid. Metastasis, again, in the differential. Here it is very nicely on the cinematic. The vessels are splayed. There's a solid mass present. Really nicely shown on the sagittal views as well. And that was desmoid fibromatosis as well in a patient with FAP. Now, it's interesting looking at these tumors. Again, it's really a challenge from a clinical perspective. This is another case looking like the prior case, except this one's even larger. And again, one of the things about desmoid fibromatosis is the size, but the lack of bowel obstruction. Now we can see lymphoma at times with large mesenteric masses and no obstruction. Things like carcinoid are gonna obstruct. Things like metastasis are gonna obstruct. So if you see a huge mass, bowel displacement, but no obstruction, you got to be thinking of desmoid tumors in the mesentery. And look at the blush on the MIP imaging. Again, we talk about vascularity. I wouldn't worry about a sarcoma. When I start seeing lots of vascularity, and desmoids can have some vascularity, but the more vascularity I see, the more concerned I am for an aggressive malignancy. And here's just a few more images of that case. And again, displacement, splaying, stretching, but no bowel obstruction and no occlusion of vessels, though there is significant abnormal vascularity present. So just a really nice example. And I'm showing you a lot of images because I want you to get a feel of how difficult this diagnosis can be. Now, I mentioned that it's a gray mimicker. Here's a mass in the right lower quadrant. Looks a little bit like the prior masses. It's somewhat cystic, it's solid. There is more stranding around it. Could this be a desmoid tumor? Well, it could be. It could also be something from the cecum. It could be something from the mesentery adjacent to the ilium. It could be from the ilium, and in fact, it could be from the appendix. This was eventually resected, and it was an adenocarcinoma of the appendix involving the cecum but you can see how similar it looked to prior cases. Another example, mass in the mesentery, but here this coarse calcification. With desmoid tumors, there's no calcification. Now carcinoid tumors can calcify up to 70%. Sclerosing mesenteritis, probably over 
with sclerosing mesenteritis, very dense calcification, no desmoplastic reaction. You can see stretching of the vessels very nicely showing you the calcification. And this was a really nice example of sclerosing mesenteritis. Again, um, mesenteric fat is involved. You can have fat necrosis. You usually don't have bowel obstruction. The biggest challenge at times is sclerosing mesenteritis, distinguishing it from a carcinoid tumor. There are other things in the mesentery, mesenteric paniculitis, but there there's maybe punctate calcifications, but it's mainly a haziness in the mesentery and not this very dense mesentery as you saw in this case. I mentioned carcinoid. Carcinoid versus uh, sclerosing mesenteritis can be challenging, but here's a good example. With carcinoid, you have a desmoplastic reaction and you can have calcification. When you look at it in the coronal view, look how the branches of the SMA here are encased, that so-called desmoplastic reaction. That's very classic for carcinoid tumor, the spiculations, the irregularity, shown very nicely on these two images. You can see all of the large vessels gathering around, which is something very unique for carcinoid tumor. You're not gonna see it in sclerosing mesenteritis. So again, in the differential sclerosing mesenteritis and carcinoid, usually we can tell them because of the calcification, number one, the desmoplastic reaction, and the rest of the appearance in carcinoid tumors and some of the other changes in sclerosing mesenteritis. So again, carcinoid tumors enhancing far greater than desmoid tumors. And again, this desmoplastic reaction, the beating around the vessels, just a really specific appearance. Now I mentioned also lymphoma. Here's a large mass in the root of the mesentery. It's solid. If you said a desmoid tumor, I have no problem. One thing that's a little bit different here, the desmoid tumors I showed you displace vessels. This is encasing vessels. Lymphoma will commonly encase vessels. That's one of the classic things it does. And um, that can be very helpful. You can see the stretching of the vessels, the encasement, but the vessels aren't occluded. In patients with uh, desmoid tumors, the vessels are gonna be more displaced. So lymphoma is one of the things, it's the most common malignant neoplasm affecting the mesentery. We could talk about things like sandwich signs, bulky adenopathy, solitary masses. There's a range of appearances and the relationship to the vessels, this encasement can be very helpful. But sometimes with lymphoma, you only have a solid mass and it can look identical, very much identical to a desmoid tumor. And again, this pattern of involvement by lymphoma, the classic sandwich sign, but again, we only get a sandwich every once in a while. Bulky retroperitoneal adenopathy commonly accompanies the mesenteric disease and should be a clue to the diagnosis. I typically don't have an issue, but in some of those large desmoid tumors I showed you, till you had PATH, you would have considered lymphoma as well. So going back, desmoid tumors are rare. They're locally aggressive. They can simulate other tumors. Desmoid tumors can occur anywhere from the abdominal wall to the retroperitoneum and the pelvis. Desmoids in the mesentery are more common in patients with familial polyposis than just an incidental finding, but it, indeed it can occur. So I've gone through a number of things I showed you some really nice cases of mesenteric desmoid tumors for you to think about them. I showed you some of the things that they can simulate and look like, and hopefully I've given you enough information so that you can reach the correct diagnosis in the future. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.